All right. Morning. New. It's the second eight weeks. Can you believe it? Well, I guess it's not eight weeks. It's seven and a half. Se seven weeks. I think I think we only have fifteen. We we're one week short. I can tell you that. So, we're halfway through. Uh, which I mean, if you can't, if you believe it, it's kind of kind of crazy. Uh, so we have next week. Just a reminder. Next week is is our exam. So next week Friday, we'll do the same thing. Uh, I'll have the exam go live first thing in the morning on that Friday. Uh, you'll have all day, all day to take it. So plan your day. Figure out when you when you'll have it when you'll be able to take it. Um, I'm not sure if there's going to be a word list or not, um, or if I'm going to switch like have the definitions more of, uh, you know, the here's the definition. Which of these words is, is the definition? Uh, may it may change that up. Uh, we'll see. We'll see. But that is next week Friday. Uh, next week Friday, since we have the exam, we won't meet here for lab or we won't meet here for class. Uh, I'll be up here if you wanted to come up and take your exam during this time, but you don't have to. Uh, last time I came up, I stayed up until about five after eight or so, 10 after eight, uh, and then, then I went down to my office. All right, lab this week uh, is, we're going to look at the data. Estimate population sizes. So this is second part two of a two-week lab. Uh, no quiz. Uh, bring your calculators. Uh, if you have a laptop, you can bring your laptop. Uh, if you noticed, I posted uh, an Excel spreadsheet that will automatically calculate 95% confidence intervals. You will note on that sheet that I could have very easily had it tell you what the population size is, but I'm not, I'm not doing that. Uh, you have to know how to how to estimate population sizes from these data. All right, uh, the ninety five percent confidence intervals. Uh, that's another story. That's why I made that Excel spreadsheet. So uh, you can download it, save it to your computer or laptop if you're bringing one, uh, or you can wait until we get into the lab. Um, the lab will be longer. Uh, we'll take take you know, most of the time because we end up with the simulation where you simulate some data, simulate marker capture, uh, and intentionally violate assumptions to see what happens. All right. Next week, lab is outside. We will be out here on campus. Um, we're going to knock on some wood here that it doesn't rain because uh, it's, it's rained the last few times we've been out, out there. So hopefully uh, it doesn't rain. Next week's lab, we are normally done by four o'clock. All right? So we'll come meet in the lab, talk about what we're doing, and then we'll go out and, and collect our data. Any questions? All right, let's see. Uh, we left off, so we did our uh, Lodic systems, so rivers and streams and so forth. So just kind of as, as a review, we're talking about environmental variation. This environmental variation is discontinuities in physical and chemical properties uh, of the area. And those are tied to things like climate, all right? So temperature and precipitation. We talked about terrestrial effects. Now we're looking at the aquatic systems because they're going to be a little bit different. Yeah, we have, in general, the same patterns where, you know, if we're near the equator, water's going to be warmer. If we're near the poles, the water's going to be colder. You have some of that same stuff. But the water poses a different set of problems for organisms. First one was, was light. Light hits the water, and it's going to be absorbed, and it's going to be scattered. And that means that deeper you are in the water column, the lower the light intensity, and the different wavelengths. There's going to be a different wavelength down, down there compared to if you were right at the surface. The other thing that organisms have to deal with is water flow. All right? 
So the water isn't like air where we can swipe through the air and, and move freely. All right, when you get into water, you move your arm, you can feel the resistance. Organisms have to deal with that. All right, so we started our discussion of, of the, the variation in aquatic systems with our freshwater systems, and specifically these lodic systems. That are, so the lodic system is composed of flowing water. These are streams and rivers. And the continuum, the river continuum, has variation in a lot of its properties, in a lot of its chemical uh, and physical properties. So a lot of these properties correlate to the stream order or the hierarchical position in that river continuum. Up at the headwaters, you tend to have your cooler waters, your faster flowing waters, um, and also waters that have the highest oxygen content. These waters don't really have a whole lot of autochthonous production, so production by algae and, and aquatic plants. Instead, a lot of their organic material enters the system from the terrestrial world. We call this a coarse particulate organic matter, the CPOMs. All right? These are entering the system, and thus the community, the organismal community, is going to reflect that. You're going to have shredders in your systems. You're going to have these collectors in your systems. These organisms that are going to break that stuff down, that coarse particulates down, into the finer particles. And as they're doing that, they're providing a food source for some of the, the higher predators. As we travel down our system, down our stream, we go from these coarse particulates down to the fine particulates and, and become even, even finer than that. So we see a transition in our invert community uh, from shredders collectors to primarily collectors and grazers all the way down to primarily collectors. So the grazers appear because once our water starts to become enriched with some nutrients and as we get away from the headwaters that tend to be small areas, faster flowing, and really shaded, all right, we, eliminate, we move away from that type of habitat to wider, slower movement, more sunlight coming in. So production now starts to change more to autochthonous production. You still have outside inputs entering into that system, but we're now having the, the, the uh, plankton, the algae growing. And in this system, it's primarily paraphyton. So the stuff that's attached to rocks and boulders and, and submerged logs and so forth. So now that you have that as a food source, that's where the grazers come in. And then right down at the bottom, we're at the lowest. We tend to be murky. To, uh, what, we would, what I would describe as murky, but you have suspended particles, all right? You have your collectors there because they're capturing all of those fine organic particles, uh, and you have just a gradual transition um, until we get to the brackish water of the river mouth, all right? So we talked about oxygen content. It's highest at the lower order stream. It's going to be lower down here, uh, and it, it's kind of twofold. One, we have agitation. We've got a lot of surface area uh, relative to the volume up, uh, up at the top, but it's also cooler, and colder water holds more oxygen. As we get down closer to the, to the mouth of the river, water is going to be flowing slow, more slowly. There's going to be less surface area relative to the volume, so you don't have that, that oxygen transfer happening, the, the dissolution into the water. And the water tends to be warmer, which means the water holds less nutrients, uh, I'm sorry, less oxygen. All right, so we talked about communities and the fish, fish communities also reflect those changes. Now, the lentic systems, these are the systems where the water is not flowing. So this is your freshwater ponds and your lakes. All right, the characteristics of these systems, of these lentic systems, are really determined by the size and depth of the lake itself. So it's a term that we call the basin. What does the basin look like in these lakes? That basin's going to ultimately determine how the lake operates and a lot of its, its chemical uh, gradients. Now, just as an example, we're gonna talk about a deeper lake, all right? We're gonna talk about a deeper lake. And we're gonna do that because these deeper lakes uh, exhibit a temperature gradient throughout them. This gradient is going to affect 
the distribution of both oxygen and nutrients. And we're not talking about the horizontal distribution, we're talking about the vertical distribution in that lake. Now, why is that? Well, it's because our temperatures in the water have different densities, and this is going to lead to stratification. So stratification is a layering of our, uh, of our water column, and the layering is determined by its temperature. Now, these layers help form because we'll have limited circulation. So that kind of really allows us to get a layer of warm water at the top and a layer of cold water at the bottom. Now, in these deep lakes, this stratification uh, is most stable over the summer months. So what does that mean? It means that over the summer, we'll get the stratification and it stays stratified until we get to the fall and temperatures start to drop. Oops. All right. So, what is this stratification? So, in our lake, we have three distinct layers the epilimnian, the hypolimnian, and the thermocline. Our epilimnian, epi on top, that is our upper, well-mixed, and warmer waters of the lake that are above the thermocline. It is this area where we have agitation, surface agitation. You have circulation in that area because of that agitation. And you have oxygen being dissolved into that surface area. So we're going to have an oxygen-rich re region all right, because of that surface agitation. Also. This layer has a lot of sunlight. So we're going to have our phytoplankton growing and photosynthesizing. Now, as you know, in photosynthesis, you know, it takes CO2 from the air to, to get it and fix it into a sugar molecule. All right? And in this process, they produce oxygen. So it's a combined action of the waves, the surface agitation, and photosynthesis that really brings oxygen content up. And, you know, as like an FYI, if we went out and monitored oxygen content throughout the day, you'll actually see it rise. You'll see it rise during the day, and then you'll see it drop at night. And that's all tied to uh, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis during the day, and then respiration of these same organisms at night. You may have had this lab in high school. I'm not sure if you've done, if you have or not. Uh, I believe what, what, they've, what they've done is uh, they put the plant in a, in a test tube and they put the test tube upside down it's full of liquid uh, and I believe what you can do is, is monitor how the air changes. I'm going back I think that was freshman biology for me. I remember setting them up looking at it but I, I didn't I, I honestly don't remember the rest of it but you may, you may have remembered it. All right so the epilimnians at the top that's our warm surface area and then we get to a layer called the thermocline. This thermocline is the layer of the lake where the temperature and the density of the lake change rapidly. All right, so water, you know, warmer water, uh, warmer water is less dense. It's going to float on top than the colder water. And at this layer, this thermocline, we have a drastic change in our temperature. And because of that drastic change, we're going to have a drastic change in our densities. If you've swam in a lake, in a deeper lake, you've probably felt this thermocline. You know, it's warm up at the surface, and then you feel the cold, the cold layer down by your feet. How far down it is, uh, it's just kind of dependent on the lake, you know, and the temperature differences and, and so forth. Now, what, what this, is, this thermocline is important because it marks our transition in our densities. And that transition limits the circulation between our upper layer, the epilimnian, and the lower layer, the hypolimnian. So this thermocline is kind of like a break and keeps oxygen from getting down to the bottom of the lake, keeps nutrients from rising back up to the surface. 
This lower layer is called the hypolimnia, hypolimnion. This is the lower, denser, colder water in a lake. It's below the thermocline. All right? And this layer, not only is it colder, but it tends to be oxygen poor. And I put usually in parentheses, and, and I think you'll, you'll see why. You can, can kind of go back and mark in your notes as you review this as to, you know, why is it usually? All right. Actually, it's here, but you'll, you'll see why. But usually, we, we don't get the oxygen transfer down to the bottom, so any oxygen that's there usually ends up being taken up by the decomposition that happens. So anything that dies in our surface water is going to fall, fall down through the layers, gets down to the bottom, and now we have our decomposition happening. And if it's aerobic decomposition, it's sucking up the oxygen. So you can have the possibility of having low oxygen content in the hypolimnion, and then at the benthos, which is the very bottom, that being actually anoxic and having no oxygen whatsoever. All right, so since we don't have water movement between these layers, we have the potential to make this hypolimnion hypoxic, so below the oxygen needed uh, for organisms, or anoxic, so no oxygen. And also, anything that gets down to the benthos and breaks down and is decomposed, that's releasing nutrients back into the water, but it gets locked away in the hypolimnion. You don't ever get it back until we have a turnover event. All right, so these turnover events happen in the fall and they can happen in the spring. And what that is, is basically a complete mixing of our lake at that point. All right, so why does it happen? It happens because we have the stratification. All right, so the warm epilimnians at top, the cold hypolimnians down at the bottom, your thermocline marks that transition point. What's gonna happen is you have the surface cooling in the fall. As that water cools, the density increases. So it's going to want to, it wants to fall. All right. But that's only part of the story. The other thing that we need is some wind to be blowing to agitate that surface and set up some circulation in that surface to try to get that colder water to break through that thermocline. And what we're doing is you know, we're not just breaking through the thermocline. We're trying to destroy that temperature and that density gradient. And once we can get that destroyed, then what happens is the lake will mix. And a lot of times what we will see is it's not just, it's not just this, this wind action that's causing the agitation, but it's actually the currents. So in a lake, I'll do something extreme. We have our wind blowing. And if we look at the surface of the lake, your elevation surface is higher on one end than the other end because the wind's pushing the water. The wind's pushing that surface water. So what we're doing is having a net movement of water down that, that area. You're leaving water here. You're displacing it. Well, it has to get the water from someplace. Where does it get it? It gets it from below the surface. When it gets to the end, that water has to go someplace. Where does some of that water go? It goes down to the bottom. So you've got your, your temperature differences cooling down. All right, Surface water is able to get through that thermocline. And because we have that wind ad adding that agitation, we're going, to have, we're going to get more of a circulation that allows the entire lake to mix. All right. So we have a mixing of oxygen and nutrients. So all of those nutrients that were locked away at the hypolimnion can get recycled back up to the surface. All of that oxygen that's up at the surface gets recycled down into the epilimnion. That doesn't happen when we have stratification. So same type of system. We have our wind blowing. We have our wind blowing, but now we have a thermocline there. And what happens is our wind blows the water there. 
but that temp that density difference prevents our water from getting down into that hypolimnion. So we still have this type of pattern where we've got the mixing and the agitation happening, but that thermocline prevents it from getting down into our hypolimnion. Move that a little bit. Okay, got it. I cut uh, we cut off that that image slightly. All right, any questions right now? So in the fall, this happens. Usually, usually it happens. All right. So that's when it happens in the fall, we call it fall turnover. All right. So it's caused by cooling of the surface water and the wind contributing to the mixing. You can also get it in the spring. Now the spring is a little, little bit different because what's happening is as we go into the fall and the winter, we have freezing, surface freezing, and you get ice formation. Now what's the density of ice relative to water, to liquid water? Dense it. Is it higher? Lighter. Oh, lighter. Yes, lighter. Less dense, right? Ice floats. So ice forms at the top, it floats. All right. And then, you know, it sets up the ice, and, and it's actually pretty, kind of, if you're into aquatic systems, it's kind of an interesting thing that happens once the ice forms because. If the ice is clear, you can still have photosynthesis that happens below, below the surface, all right? But you've got your layer of ice, and that water layer right underneath it is cold still, all right? It's almost at freezing. Now, when we have, you know, the ice melting, you have, you know, very cold water. So ice freezes at, what, zero degrees Celsius? Right? We could say, we'll use Celsius, zero degrees Celsius. So that water's at like one degrees, maybe, when it melts. All right? That water is still light. But as it warms, it, gets, it becomes more dense because at four degrees Celsius, that marks the highest density of the water at that point. So you have the melting of your ice. All right? It warms up to four degrees. And then that four degrees is as dense as the water as it can possibly be, and that allows now the top layer and the bottom layer, the epi and the hypolimnium, to mix if there's wind. Now, does this happen all the time? No, it, it doesn't, all right? It's gonna be dependent on the basin itself, so the shape of, of the lake, the depth of the lake, all right? It also kinda depends on, on the wind and, you know, did it really, you know, how much ice did you get and so forth. So there, there's a lot of things that go on. Uh, you do have possibility where fall turnover happens, so fall turnover happens, but then spring turnover is maybe 50%. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. All right. So the ice cream could never swallow, is that called permacline? A permacline, possibly. Come on, there's no bodies down in Lake Tahoe. Uh, All right, so a qu question was uh, a thing called a permacline. I don't know if that's a real term, possibly, but there is this thing where the lakes don't mix, uh, and this is the deep lakes. So you mentioned Lake Tahoe. Yeah, Lake Tahoe is a deep lake. Uh, some of the Canadian Shield lakes don't mix because they're deep, and they don't really ever warm up completely. All right. Uh, you have some lakes where you, do, you, you can't get this cycling because there's not enough force to, to do that. All right, so yeah, some of those lakes, down at that very bottom, it's, if it's hypoxic or anoxic, it's probably going to stay that way uh, because you don't get that mixing. Um, you have some lakes, like lakes down here, where you probably don't get the thermocline. It's just too warm of a lake. So like the entire 
you know, a lake is all one temperature. Uh, I think that what the average depth of Lake Nasworthy is like less than 10 feet, I believe. Uh, I've never swam in there. I can't tell you if there's a thermocline, but that's kind of a shallow lake. A lot of those shallow lakes, if you do start getting a thermocline developing, usually the wind ends up causing it to break down and never really uh, establish. All right. Twin Buttes? Yeah. It's a deeper lake, too. Yep, yep. So there's a lot of things that, that, that go into like how this sets up and, and so forth. But you have to think about the organisms that live here, right? You have to think about the organisms that, that live there. Any questions? All right, so we have the stratification. That's kind of important for the lakes. We also have zonation. All right, and the zonate, so we can't really talk about the communities and the stratification until we learn about the zonation. So the lakes are classified based on where we are in the water column itself and dis where we are in relation to shore. All right, so these zones are based on the light. You know, how much light is, is getting there? All right, so the photic zone is the region where photosynthesis occurs. Okay, so in this region of the lake, the light levels are above the light compensation point. So you can have photosynthesis. And this expands across the entire lake, doesn't matter where we are in relation to the shore. All right, so anywhere where we are, we're in the photic zone, we can have photosynthesis. And that means that's where we're gonna see our phytoplankton, that's where we're gonna see our aquatic vegetation, that's where we'll see our periphyton in, in these lakes and so forth. Now, if we're close to shore, where we have vegetation, emergent and sub submerged vegetation, this is called the littoral zone. The littoral zone. This is the near shore, sh shallow region of the lake. This region is in the photic zone, so you have photosynthesis, but you also have vegetation. You have your aquatic vegetation. This is your, your algae, your, what you would call seaweed, you know, generically speaking, all right? Your cattails popping up, your lily pads, and so forth. That's all the littoral zone. So you can imagine, you know, the organismal community here is going to be dominated by things like, you know, your crustaceans that are feeding on, you know, plankton, your predatory crustaceans, you know, things that are feeding on the periphyton, so the algae that's attached to this vegetation, your, your herbivores, along with some of your larger organisms, so some of your smaller fish that are using, that are feeding on those microcrustaceans in that area, and also using it as protection, as a nursery, because you have all the vegetations providing habitat, uh, hiding spots for these to avoid larger predators. As we move away from the shore and away from those areas where we have ve our vegetation, we enter the pelagic zone. This is also called the limnetic zone. It's a littoral zone and then the limnetic zone. All right, this zone is the open deep water portion of a lake distant from shore. This is the region that doesn't have any sort of uh, any sort of vegetation, aquatic vegetation. This pelagic zone can include the photic zone, all right, or it can include uh, the region below that. Uh, Yeah, it's the open water. Usually it's, it's, it's above that light compensation point. Because below that light compensation point, below that photic zone, is our aphotic zone or the profundal zone. So this profundal zone, that's the region of the lake below the light compensation point. And below that, we're not going to have our aquatic vegetation. So you can say it's more of in, in our deeper regions. But it doesn't necessarily include 
the very bottom part of the lake. Because that very bottom, the substrate, the substrate and the substratum, that is our benthic zone. So the benthic zone is the deepest water in the substrate of the lake. That benthic zone can extend all the way from the littoral zone down into our profundal zone. So the benthic zone is just basically the bottom. Yeah, it's bottom of the lake. It's the mud and muck and anything that lives on top of it. All right, and I think this, this image was pretty, pretty good because it shows you, it marked the photic zone and it marked the thermocline. So the thermocline doesn't mark where our photic zone ends. So it, what, what marks that the end of that photic zone is how, light the deep, the, how deep the light can penetrate. All right, and that can fluctuate. That can fluctuate on a daily basis. It just kind of depends on uh, your you know, suspended solids in that lake. All right. So I've got the handouts. I have these diagrams in the handouts uh, if you want to print them out and have them in your notes. Questions? All right. So what is this connect? What are lakes and ponds connection to the terrestrial system. We already mentioned the connection in these, uh, in the ponds and river, I'm sorry, in the rivers and streams. We said that it's these coarse particulates, organic matter. Those things are washing into the river, adding the allochthonous resources. Well, the same things are gonna happen here with the lakes, but our watershed's gonna be much narrower. Wherever you have that lake, you have to look at the surrounding topography to see where our slopes are, where the gradients are. So you can have lakes with a very wide watershed area, and you can have lakes that have a very small watershed area. And that watershed area determines the productivity, the overall productivity of our lake. All right? So we have some specific terms that describe the productivity of these lakes. First term is eutrophic system. All right, so a eutrophic system and I should have bold, made these in bold face, but eutrophic system is an aquatic system that is highly productive. All right, so it's an aquatic system in which our nutrients accumulate and stimulate high rates of photosynthetic production. All right, so when I talk about production of a lake, I'm talking about that photosynthesis. How much photosynthesis do we have? Because the lakes, lakes and ponds are predominantly autochthonous systems. All right. They're producing their own through photosynthesis. So a eutrophic system is one that has plenty of nutrients, and we're going to see a lot of photosynthesis occurring, a lot of algae, you know, phytoplankton, paraphyte, and, and so forth, all right? A lot of that that provides them a food source for everything above it in its food, food web, all right? So our communities in these eutrophic systems tend to be dominated by production level diversity. We'll learn this term. This is a bottom-up effect. All right? Our food source is what ultimately determines how many organisms it can sustain and the diversity of organisms that it can sustain in our system. That's what, that's what we mean by this production-driven diversity. But sometimes having all these nutrients can be a bad thing. Sometimes excess nutrients lead to a hypertrophic type of system. So hyper meaning more or above, excess. All right, so a hypertrophic system is a highly eutrophic aquatic system with massive amounts of photosynthetic production. Now you might say, well, massive amounts of photosynthetic production, isn't that a good thing? And I'd say, no, it's actually not. Not in a lake system. All right, why is that? It's because you're not just having all of this photosynthesis that's going and utilizing the nutrients. All of those things, they have a lifespan. 
The algae, they have a lifespan. They're going to die. And when it dies, they're going to sink. And as they sink, they're going to decompose. And as they decompose, it sucks up the oxygen. So it's kind of an interesting thing, interesting thing to, to see. You have a huge influx of nutrients into the this, into this system. All right? The nutrients stimulate photosynthetic production. You stimulate an increase in photosynthesis, replication, reproduction of all this algae and, and the, the phytoplankton, paraphyton, and, and so forth. All right? You have this increase. That increase starts to block light below it. All right? So those things are going to die. All right? They're getting re re replaced. They're sinking below the photic zone, and they're decomposing. And eventually, what you end up getting is very low to zero oxygen levels in that lake. So this excess nutrients completely changes the community in these systems, drastically changes it. And what we end up seeing is usually a loss of organisms, a loss of invertebrate communities, loss of vertebrate communities in this system. And it's just basically, I would call it a dead lake or a dead system because all it has in there is as algae, and that's about it, algae and bacteria. Now, these hypertrophic systems, can they be naturally derived? Yeah, you can get them naturally, all right? If you have a large watershed, a whole lot of rain at one point that sweeps in a lot of nutrients all at once. But usually these hypertrophic systems are due to human influence. So where might you find one of these systems, one of these ponds, or one of these lakes? Near agricultural fields. Near agricultural fields and? And? City runoff. City runoff. Yeah, you're right. So, he, okay. Uh, yeah, places of human influence. So, yeah, agricultural is a big one because you get you got your runoff from the fields. Uh, I was going to say golf courses are a major one. But when, when you mentioned, you know, near cities and, and, and uh, cities and suburbs, you know, uh, residential areas, <laughs> they, you know, fertilize their grass. And... Since you have a lot of roads and parking lots, I mean, you don't, you don't have that opportunity for the water to sink in. It just kind of washes right off, right? Sheet flow, sheet flow. We talked about that. All right, so we've got our eutrophic system that's at one end. Hypertrophic is above that, normally human influence, all right? And then below that, we have our oligotrophic system. So oligotrophic, that's our few, all right? Oligo, all right? These are aquatic systems with low nutrient levels, low rates of photosynthetic production, all right? Alpine lakes, all right? They have a low watershed. They usually have a granite basin. You don't have, you know, a very thick substrate uh, for these types of lakes. Canadian shield lakes, all right? They also tend to often have a granite basin, but they also tend to be deep. And with these lakes, these alpine lakes and the Canadian shield lakes, you often don't have complete mixing during turnover. So nutrients that get in there tend to be locked away down into, into that hypolimnium. All right? So what we see in these lakes is you don't really have a whole lot of nutrients. All right? You still see photosynthesis. It's still going because it's, it's, we see communities there. You see you know, fish communities and so forth and bird communities utilizing the lake. But it's not at the level of the eutrophic system. And our communities are going to be different. So instead of this bottom-up type of response, where it's all driven by the, the primary production, these types of lakes are consumer-driven. So they're, they're basically a top-down type of community. Whatever the top predator is in that area, that ultimately determines how many individuals and the types of species that can exist below it. All right? And we'll talk somewhat about these communities, bottom-up versus top-down effects and so forth later. All right? So the oligotrophic systems, less, less photosynthesis. Uh, 
compared to the eutrophic systems. Uh, and it could have a lot of nutrients, but those nutrients could be locked away in the hypolimnion. Questions? All right, so let's, yeah, let's give a quick review. So a quick review of freshwater systems before we leave. So the fundamental dichotomy between these two systems, between lentic and lotic, comes down to the water. Is it flowing or is it standing still? All right, and that ultimately determines what your primary photosynthetic organism is. So if the, if the lake is standing still, or if the water is standing still, doesn't exhibit a whole lot of movement, you're gonna have this phytoplankton, the floating algae, as a primary source of production. All right. If you're in a uh, lentic type of system uh, where the water is constantly flowing, all right, you can't have floating algae because it just gets swept right down the stream. I mean, you do, you have it, all right? But you're gonna rely more on paraphyton, so the algae that's attached to rocks and surfaces and so forth. All right. That's our fundamental difference between those two types of systems. Both of them can interact with the terrestrial environment. All right. And their interaction really comes down to acquiring aquatic nutrients or aqu acquiring nutrients and organic material. So this is our autochthonous and allochthonous sources. Our streams and rivers tend to rely a lot on the allochthonous sources, especially at the sources, at the lower stream orders. And then anything that gets in there can now filter its way down the river continuum. The amount of allochthonous sources going into a lake or a pond depends on the watershed area. So the larger the watershed, the more nutrients and uh, organic sources you can get into those systems. In some cases, you have a lot of nutrient addition, and that can lead to eutrophication. So we mentioned eutrophic systems. Well, eutrophication, eutrophication is the accumulation of nutrients in a body of water leading to an increase in photosynthetic production. All right, so we can go from an oligotrophic, oligotrophic system, have steady supply of nutrients into that lake to increase its, its nutrient content, increase its photosynthetic content, and transition it to a eutrophic system. I'm going to say, I bet the most famous case of this is Lake Erie. All right, huge nutrient influx, gradually changed the system with that lake to a eutrophic type of lake, almost hypertrophic. That's a classic case. Now, if we do have eutrophication, stopping the nutrient additions can get it back to its, its natural state if it's an oligotrophic lake. If you start with a eutrophic lake and you have all these nutri nutrients, eutrophication would produce a hypertrophic lake. And as I said, this could be natural. It's a large watershed area, big rainfall sweeps a lot of nutrients in, that's natural. Or it could be human induced, you know, excess nutrients, the you know, chemical companies dumping phosphates into the water, uh, causing increase in production. Any questions? All right, let's stop there with our freshwater systems. We'll finish up the marine systems uh, on Wednesday. If you have any questions as you review this, please email me. Don't forget, we have our quiz. Quiz uh, closes tonight, I believe, at 1130. Uh, that is 4.1, so variation in our terrestrial systems. And then we'll get this one up. So next, on Wednesday, that quiz should go live. Uh, and then I think I'll give you until the end of the day on Friday to, to get it done, to get our aquatic system stuff done. All right. Enjoy the Monday.